right, let me just pray and then we're going to jump right in to our message today. Uh, look, Heavenly Father, we give this moment over to you. We come, we open our hearts, we open our minds. We have soft hearts, Lord, this morning uh, to be changed. Lord, Holy Spirit, uh, do your work in us. Lord, speak through the words that have been prepared um, in order to bring transformation today. Lord, we know that you hold the keys to life. And Lord, we want to experience some of your life and your freedom today. We want to walk out of here in a greater sense of freedom than we arrived. Uh, all because of you and to your glory, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Okay, so we're in this series. Uh, freedom, the life you always wanted. Turn to the person next to you and say, the life you always wanted. Exactly. It's a big statement, isn't it? The life you always wanted. It sounds, I was thinking about this this week, it sounded like uh, some kind of advert or billboard. You know, uh, maybe a saga cruise holiday. I can imagine my, my parents on the, on the deck of a ship, sipping their margaritas, uh, lying on their sun lounges as the ship sails off into the distance and the voiceover says, the life you always wanted. <laughs> That's what you want, right? No. <laughs> the life I always wanted. No, no, I wouldn't say that. Or maybe an, it's a, an advert for a, one of those snazzy German cars. And you know those adverts where you see the, the car zipping around the winding roads in the Italian Alps and, and there's a close-up of the guy looking all beautiful driving the car and then a, a close-up maybe of his wife who's also looking beautiful and the kids in the back all serene looking at the views as they go around these winding roads. The life you always wanted. And I was thinking, that's just not reality. I don't know if you've ever driven with kids around winding roads. <laughs> Here's what happens. Dad, I'm going to be sick. If you're lucky, you get some warning. Any parents here cleaned up sick from their kids in the car? Never. Never huh? never you've never had it? Never had Man, you've got good kids. You've got good kids. <laughs> For your car? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I've seen your driving. It's probably a good idea. <laughs> Cleaning vomit off car seats. That's not the life you always wanted. Uh, but that would be real, though. Maybe they should show that on the advert. But think about advertisers. They overpromise and they underdeliver. Right? They promise the world. They promise freedom. They promise a better life. They promise the life that you want. But they don't hold the keys to those things. They don't, they promise it, but they can't, they can't give you them. So what makes this series any different? What makes this different? Why, you know, how can I say this to you? And you go, yeah, I believe it. Or well, the reason that we can believe it is because we're going back to the source. We're going back to the word of God. God, the one who made us, the one who knows us better than the advertisers know us, better than, in fact, we know ourselves. He knows us. So if he promises freedom, if he promises a life that's better, if he promises the life that we, that we want, that we actually want, we know he can deliver on it. And so we can believe what we read. And, and freedom, I don't know, obviously we've been preparing for this season, uh, series, sorry. Freedom is all over the Bible. There's metaphors for freedom. There's actual words about freedom. There's so many statements about living a free life and having freedom. So we just need to believe it. And God can give us a blueprint for this way that we can find freedom. We've had a couple of messages so far. We've talked about the promise of freedom. We've talked about, uh, uh, I think it was Fabiano talked about the pursuit of freedom. Andy last week talked about the purpose of freedom. And today we're looking at the pathway to freedom. The pathway uh, to freedom. And if we look carefully through the word of God, if we look with an open mind and with soft hearts, then we can find the pathway to freedom. So what's going to be our starting point today on this pathway? Where are we going to begin? Well, there's a scripture. The scripture doesn't actually mention freedom, but it's, it's an important one. It's probably one that you've, you've read before. Maybe you've even highlighted it or underlined it in your Bible. Maybe you've memorized it. It's one of those. It's, it's an important one. It's a good one. And it's taken from Paul's letter to the Romans. And it's chapter 12. And it's the second verse. So Romans chapter 12, verse 2. If you've got a Bible, if you've got a gadget, then find this. If you haven't highlight, high, highlighted, highlight, if you highlight this, then do that or underline it in your Bible. It's a good one to, uh, to learn. And this is what it says. 
It says, Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Paul writing says this, Do not conform to the pattern of this world. This is kind of, in the prayer meeting before the service, my mom always likes to steal my thunder, or whoever's speaking, she likes to steal their thunder by talking about what we're speaking about. She brings a word from God. And this morning she was talking about how, you know, there's our old man and our new man, and we have to put off our old man and put on our new man. This is kind of the saying the same thing. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will know, Sorry, then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. If we want to live a life that's, that's good for us, that is actually pleasing for us, that perhaps is in fact even perfect for us, then we need to know what God's will is. And Paul is saying the way that we understand how to get this life, and that sounds like a free life to me, a life of freedom, knowing his good, pleasing and perfect will and walking in it. It says there's two kind of broad instructions that he's giving us in order to find and live this life, in order to find that pathway towards freedom. All right, so the first instruction then he says is do not, it's a negative instruction, do not conform to the pattern of this world. And that's kind of what I was talking about at the beginning, kind of the way that you know, the things that the advertisers and marketing companies push, things that the world pushes on us and says, this is the way you should live. This is what you should be desiring. This is what you, you really want. This is the way to get the life that you always wanted. They push away. But it's a way that we shouldn't conform to. And the thing about the way that they push is they make it all about you or all about me. They make it all about the individual. So let's talk about the pattern of this world. Uh, In the last century, there was this gradual shift, which was kind of pushed by society, pushed by the media, pushed by advertisers, pushed by marketing companies, and it was a shift uh, uh, away from a collective mindset towards an individual mindset. Moving us away from a collective mindset towards an individual mi- a mindset, from a way that living that promoted and celebrated community and society to a way that promotes and celebrates the individual. And if you look at the, at the way, you know, in times gone by, you know, look at the Second World War or the First World War, the way that communities would come together, the way that there was this sense that you didn't live for yourself, but you lived for others. I was reading uh, Winston Churchill's quote this week, his very famous speech that he did in the House of Commons, we will fight them on the beaches, we will fight them on the landing grounds. And and he's talking, and he's encouraging this sense of community. He's encouraging, all the way through the speech, this sense of togetherness, we've got to do this for one another. There's a sense that you sacrifice your own needs and your own desires for the desires of others. And so uh, that was, uh, there's been this gradual shift, and it's come alongside the development of technology. I think that's been part of it. So particularly in household um, uh, technology, uh, things like washing machines and, and dryers and dishwashers and kind of uh, gadgets for mowing the lawn and ready meals and microwaves and vacuum cleaners. So chores that used to take all day suddenly took less time. And how did the advertisers sell these things to us? They said, you will have more free time for you. How many of us know that's just not true? How many of us feel like we have so much more free time now? (laughs) So much more. It's just not true, but that was the agenda that they pushed. They made it all about you. And there's these words that came into the English lexicon, I think in the 1980s. These words, me time. Me time. Yeah, we've all heard it. Maybe we've even, maybe we've even said it. Uh, we've been sold the lie that the route to happiness and the route to fulfillment and the pathway to freedom is to focus on me. So if I'm struggling in my life, what I need is more me time. You would have never heard those words in the Second World War. I'm sorry to see that your house has been bombed and it's falling down. I just need a bit of me time. It just just wouldn't exist. 
There was a sense of community and the collective. And we're moving more and more towards the individual. Now we've become more and more individualized. And I'm not saying that the collective was all good and individualism is all bad. And I'm not saying technology is bad. I love technology. I love the way that it can help us in life. But don't tell me my life is better because of it or freer because of it. Because that's just not true. This march towards individualism has created more loneliness, more isolation, and the knock-on effects of depression and anxiety and mental health issues. And Andy touched on this a little bit last week. And this is what we're experiencing in the modern world. More of these things. We are racing towards an ever more disconnected society. And the number of teens and young adults with clinical depression and suicidal tendencies has just experienced a massive upsurge in recent years. And studies show that depression has increased roughly tenfold in the last two generations. Ten times what it was two generations ago. And it's easy for older generation, people like me, to look at the young people who are struggling with this and say, come on, pull yourself together, get a grip. It wasn't, you know, we didn't have these issues. Why have you got these issues? But the truth is, it's not their fault. They look at their own lives and they're asking themselves, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? And there probably is something wrong with you. But, as well as that, this is a flow that society has been pushing on us for decades. The point is, you are on a path that has been created. It's like a conveyor belt or it's like this flow of a river that is moving in a certain direction. I don't know if you've ever been on in in a um, kind of water park and been on a lazy river. You know where it just, you have these pumps that are pushing the water in a certain direction and you just lie there and it takes you around. We went on one, we went to Disney many years ago. There's there's a Blizzard Beach, there was this huge one that took like 15 minutes to go around and you just lie there and it would take you around. That's what society has done, it's created this, this, this flow. And you have to be intentional about getting off that flow. And just like in a lazy river, if you want to come off, you have to work against the current. You have to flow, move against the current to come off that flow. Do you know there's even a minister for loneliness now? There's actually, in the UK, we have a minister responsible for loneliness. Over the last few years, that's come in. But do you know, there is one area of society that is bucking this trend. That is seeing something different. Do you know what it is? It's the church. We're seeing different things. Studies, and even secular studies, are seeing that people who go to church, there is less of these issues, less mental health issues, less depression, less anxiety. In fact, what they call it is belonging to a religious community, is the words that they use. Helps. Helps in this way. It Actually, you live longer. People who go to church live longer. That's what secular studies are showing. So welcome to church. I've just added two days to your life. <laughs> See you next week. <laughs> yeah, don't miss it, whatever you do. But I've realized that people who, who gather, who serve each other, who create communities, have better mental well being and live longer. And there are other studies, obviously, many, plenty of studies, that connect this, this push towards individualism with greater depression and a reduction in mental health. And I wonder. I wonder if we're going to wake up in a few years' time and realize that our kids have just been guinea pigs in this great social experiment. We've seen it in our kids, struggling. You know, we've seen, uh, you know, with the rise of social media, that's anything but social. You know, we talked about technology developments. We know that in the last century, the the TV was developed and it moved people out of community theatres and just kept them in the home. But no, it's worse than that. You've got the entertainment in your pocket. And even, I don't know what it's like in your house, but even when you're watching TV, everybody's also on their phones. They're doing two things. I always tell my kids, stop double screening. It's not allowed. Do one. But we get caught up in this and it's not healthy. Anyway, I'm going to get off my soapbox. No, but if you have kids, if you have teenagers, 
You need to be good parents. We need, we need to know why our kids are looking at. And we need to make sure that we are putting things in place to protect them from society. Even though it's hard. Even though they say to us, but all the other kids are doing it. I'm not responsible for the other kids. I'm responsible for you. Anyway. Paul says, don't conform to the pattern of this world. Don't get swept along by the flow of society. Don't just wander blindly along that path. I believe he's telling us that we're never going to find the freedom that we're looking for by going after the freedom that the world offers. So is there hope? Yes, because then he gives us a second instruction. So do not conform to the pattern of this world. That's the start. And then he says, a positive one. He says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be transformed. If you want to see a difference in your life, if you want to walk a different path, then it starts with a different in our thinking. We've got to have different thinking. Everything starts with your mind. Everything starts with your thoughts. Every action starts with a decision. Every habit begins with a choice. Every word that we speak begins with a thought. And the pathway to freedom starts with a renewed mind. Renewed from what? Renewed from the pattern of the world. We need to be renewed from the pattern of this world. Okay, I want to pause just for a second here. And I want you to kind of, you can close your eyes if you want. I want us to think, all of us, to stop and think of an area of our life that we would like freedom in. Or we would like a greater measure of freedom. What is it? Maybe it's a habit. Maybe there's something that you do that you wish you didn't do. Maybe there's something that you think you should be doing. But what area of your life, what, what bit of your life do you know you could experience more freedom in? I want you to just think of that for a moment and hold it in your head. If you've got something in your mind, that's great. This is really the first step. It starts with renewed thinking, and it starts by, obviously, we've got to hold that thought in our mind. And then we obviously have got to do something about it, but it starts with working out what that is and then making decisions to get us there. We need to change our thinking. We need to move on to a pathway that will transform our life. I was listening to a podcast a couple of weeks ago, and it really challenged me, just this one moment. And the podcast with the host was talking, and he was sharing about a... Um, a chat he had had with a guy called John Maxwell. I don't know if you've heard of John Maxwell. He's a very famous um, preacher, leadership kind of guru. He's, he's a pastor. He's an author. He's written loads of books. If you go to any kind of bookstore, particularly ones in airports, and you see the leadership books, he's got loads of books. In this, and they're all bestsellers. Like he's, he's very, very, very successful, so humble as well, but, and so godly. And this, the host... Uh, kind of had this moment with John Maxwell, and he thought, I want to ask him a good question. I want to find out something. And so he asked John Maxwell, he said, what is the first thing you think about when you wake up in the morning? And it was great, because John Maxwell didn't skip a beat. He didn't have to think about it. He said, oh, I have the same routine every day. He said, my, I, I wake up, I get a cup of coffee, I go to my study, and I open my Bible. So before I do anything else, I open my Bible. I, you know, before I check my emails or pick up my phone, I just get my coffee, open my Bible. And he said, then I pray this prayer. He said, God, help me today to bring value to someone else's life. God, help me today to bring value to someone else's life. And it's really challenged me as a as an initial everyday thought, as an initial prayer, as an initial request to God, God, every, every day, help me today to bring value into someone else's life. I thought, that is brilliant. That is such a kingdom approach. And that really is a pathway to freedom. Right there. That is turning away from the me-focused approach and a turning towards others and looking out for others, another's focused approach. God, use me to bring value, to bring freedom, to bring hope, to bring peace, to bring comfort into someone else's life today. Show me, introduce me to the person that I can make a difference in their life. You see, when we do that, 
That, I believe, that is when we find real happiness. That's when we find hope for ourselves. You don't find happiness and hope for yourself by looking for happiness and hope for yourself. These things... And I think freedom comes along with that. Is free. You don't find happiness and freedom by looking for freedom and happiness. They're a byproduct of something else. You don't find a better life by going after a better life. You go after something else, and a better life becomes a byproduct of that. And you look at your life, ah, oh, this is working. And think, what, what's the thing then that we have to go after? I think the thing that we have to go after is meaning and purpose. And you don't find meaning and purpose by focusing on you. You find meaning and purpose by focusing on others. By having an others focus. Making your life count for more than just your own benefit. And I believe to the center of my being that if we move from the pattern of the world, which is this individualistic approach, from that flow of society, we can move into a flow of freedom. <coughs> If we can do that. Jesus told a couple of parables that demonstrate this. Uh, First of all, Matthew 13, verse 44. He says this, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, he went and sold all he had and bought that field. I want us to think about this for a moment. This parable, this story, this tale. Parable just means a meaning that goes alongside a story. Something, you know, the, the truth, the, 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 uh, the purpose of the story is a meaning and it, and it goes alongside. So he's saying the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that's hidden in a field. And I think this is freedom. Or we can certainly apply freedom in this, to this context. Treasure hidden in a field is like finding that better life. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy he went and sold all he had and bought the field. Notice, he didn't go and buy the treasure. He couldn't afford the treasure. The treasure is not something he could afford. The only thing he could get was the field. And when he got the field, the treasure came along with it. And I think this is telling us that if we kind of pursue the right things... If we attain the right things, if we look into God's kingdom, if we try and uh, pursue his righteousness and his kingdom, the treasure comes along with it. We can't afford the treasure. But when we seek the right thing, when we seek the right thing, we get the treasure. We find the better life. We get the happiness. We get the freedom. What do we do? Well, the Bible's quite clear. We deny ourselves. We take up our cross. We live for others. What was Jesus' new command? Love one another as I have loved you. What did he say was the most important command? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. There's a sense of looking, looking outwards. That's where we find the treasure, when we have a life that looks outwards. But we live in this individualistic society where people try and get the treasure for themselves and whether that's, oh, I've got to find financial freedom, I'm going to work towards that, I'm going to find career freedom, I'm going to find happiness freedom. And the world tells us we have to go after these things. We should pursue these things for ourselves. The world tells us that we are entitled to them. We deserve them. But you don't find freedom in these areas by going after them. They're a byproduct of a better decision. Get the field. All right. The second parable that Jesus says, uh, we find in Luke chapter 12. And we're just going to spend just the last bit of our time looking at this uh, particular scenario. So Luke chapter 12, at the beginning of uh, chapter 12, he says something interesting. He says Jesus is teaching a crowd of people. And he says this crowd, if you look at verse 1, he says there are thousands of them. There are thousands of these crowds. And he says they're all trampling on one another. Like it's crazy. There's a lot of people come to hear Jesus speak. And in the middle of this kind of chaos, Jesus starts to teach them. Uh, And then at some point, someone in the crowd shouts up and asks a question. It says this. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, talking to Jesus, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And we don't have any more context to this question. We don't know who the guy was. He's just called someone. We don't know what his backstory is. We assume that his father's died and he's got a brother and he's probably got an older brother who's taken a greater share of the inheritance. There's, there's some story there. We don't know what it is. But what we do know is this guy feels like there's injustice here and maybe that Jesus can do something about it. But it's a strange question to ask Jesus. Like, 
And Jesus responds uh, by saying, who appointed me? The judge. Like, why are you asking me this question? Who appointed me the judge and arbiter between you? Like, it's not my responsibility to do that. And then I think Jesus kind of has this, whether it's a Holy Spirit moment, the revelation from God, and, the, and I think this is an opportunity to speak into a problem, a society problem. He sees this, and he uses this, this question as a springboard to tell a parable. Um, and it's, he starts to deal with an attitude. And this lesson that Jesus deals with, and he, the lesson that he teaches that crowd 2,000 years ago, I think he's actually so relevant to us today. And I think if we can learn this lesson, we're focusing really on one area of freedom, but uh, I think if we can get this right, so many other areas of our life kind of fall into place. I don't know if you've ever watched this series on BBC Traitors. Traitors? Yeah, some of you, some of you are nodding. Let me just tell you what Traitors is. Uh, it's, it's a TV series where about 20 people come together and are living in a hotel together. All right? and, and during the course of the series, they do games each day or, or tests, and they earn money. They kind of build, they're trying to build up a pot of money. And at the end of the series, somebody or some people get the money. Now, at the beginning, the host of the, of the uh, TV program, he chooses three of these people to be traitors and the rest to be what they call faithful. So he's choosing three traitors. Nobody knows who the traitors are. And so they've got this, this thing, this ongoing running uh, thing through, running through each episode where they've got to try and find who the traitors are. Because if there are traitors left when they get to the end, the traitors get all the money and nobody else does. All right, so each day they're voting off, they are um, banishing traitors, or trying to, and at the same time the traitors are murdering the faithful. Not really, literally, but you know, they are getting rid of the faithful, and they're trying to windle it down until you've got the last few people left. Fru and I recently watched the Australian version of this program, and this has never happened before. It got to the end of the season, the last episode, there were four people left, and three of them were the traitors. They were terrible at finding the traitors, all right? Terrible, terrible, terrible. So there were four people left, and obviously the traitors then voted off the last faithful. So it's just the traitors left. They've built up this pot of 200,000 plus dollars, which means that the traitors, the three traitors, get to share $200,000. How cool is that? But then the host says, okay, there's one more dilemma that you have to go through in order to win this money. And they have these little chalkboards that they write on. He said, all you have to do is if you want to share this money, all three of you, you know, write on your board, nobody can see, you've got to write the word share. Simple, right? If they all write share, they all share the money. He said, but if one of you writes steal, only the person who wrote steal will get the money. The other two who wrote share will get nothing. If two of you write steal, the two people who write steal get the money. The one who writes share gets nothing. If all three of you write steal, nobody gets anything. It's a great dilemma, right? And so you've got, these, you've got these three traitors who for the whole of the program have been deceiving everybody. And they're, and they're talking to each other. They say, come on, we can do this. Let's write, we'll, we'll all write share. We'll all write share. We'll share the money. And then we'll, you know, we'll, it'll all be good. There's, there's a good amount of money here. We can all share it. And they're telling each other, I'm going to write share. And so they all write their word on the board. And the host says, turns to the first one and says, okay, Sam, what did you write? And he says, I'm so sorry, everyone. You know, to the other two, I'm sorry, I wrote steel. And you think, oh no, what if they've written share? Like they will lose it all. He goes to the second person and says, what did you write? And he says, oh, I'm so sorry, I wrote steel as well. And at this point, we look into the last lady, um, who's been lovely all the way through. We think, oh no, she will have written share, she will have lost it. And he turns to her and says, okay, what did you write? He says, I also wrote steel. And you see this moment where it dawns on all three of them that they're now getting... Nothing. Their greed has got the better of them. And they've all ended up with nothing. Nothing. Their individual approach has got them nothing. It's a, it's a great moment. Like, great TV moment. Like, we're watching you go, oh my goodness, this is terrible. And I want you to keep that scenario in your mind. 
these three people holding up their placards and the regret. In fact, one guy is crying his eyes out, literally crying because of what he's done and what they've all done. And the other guy, he's, he's having a go at the others for writing steel. Like, you start, they start to berate each other. Like, why would you write that? Like, crazy. Hold that thought in your mind. So, Jesus says to the, to the crowd, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And you're probably sitting there thinking, yeah, we know that. You don't need to tell us that. And we know that our life does not consist in abundance of possessions. But I want you to see what Jesus says. He says, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. There's all sorts of different ways that we can focus on ourselves. And that's really what greed is. It's, it's focusing on yourself at the expense of others. That's what it is. And it's a great word. I don't know if you know the Greek word here for greed. It's a brilliant word. It is uh, pleonexia. Everybody say pleonexia. Pleonexia. Be on your guard against all kinds of pleonexia. It sounds like a disease, doesn't it? I've got a bad case of pleonexia. I need to get my pleonexia jab. All right? Um, but this is what Jesus is saying. He's going to give us a vaccine for pleonexia. All right? For, this, for all kinds of greed. And that's just what we need. So he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. So far, no problem. There's a rich guy. There's a guy who's got stuff. And... He works the ground and he gets an abundant harvest. No problem in that. God is not against us being successful. God doesn't, he's not insisting that everybody lives in poverty. Okay, he will provide all that we need. He said that. All right, and, and I think he's into people building businesses and, and kind of doing well at work and being productive. He's given us the brains to be creative and, and productive. It doesn't frown on us earning money. And the folk listening to, this, listening to Jesus talk about this man would have immediately thought, okay, well, this guy is blessed by God. He's a rich guy. If you were rich, if you had more than enough, then it was because God was blessing you. All right, so that's the start. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Again, no problem. This is exactly the question to ask. It's the right question. I've got, I've got more than enough. I've got stuff in my locker might be money, it might be resources, it might be time, it might be skills, it might be gifts. I've got something in my locker that I don't need all of. So the question is, what am I going to do with it? That's the right question. So far, it's the right question. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. This is the pattern of this world. Leaning towards the individual. You've earned it. It's yours. You should spend it on you. And Jesus in the parable is describing this this individualistic approach to life. the, The consumption approach. If it's come in to me, it must be for me. That's the world's way. I've heard uh, a preacher call it the consumption assumption. If, If it's come to me, it's for me. That's not the kingdom way. It sounds like... It sounds like it would lead to freedom. The guy thought it was leading to freedom. I've got all this. I've got plenty of grain. I've got everything I need. I can now take life easy. I can eat, drink, and be merry. haven't got to worry about my life at all. It came to me. It must be for me. It sounds like freedom, but in fact, it ends up being slavery. It end, you end up becoming enslaved to the things that you are a master over. Instead of you owning the money, you find pretty far down the road that the money owns you. God said to this rich man, he said, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? And this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. Jesus in another place, he says, store up for yourself treasure in heaven where moth and rusts don't destroy. Store up treasure in heaven. The things you can't take with you, like 
Don't store up those things for yourself. Store up treasure in heaven. What is treasure? It's people. It's people that you take to heaven. That is heavenly treasure. What does it mean being rich towards God? Honoring God with what we have. Whether it's money, whether it's time, whether it's a comforting word, whether it's your talents, whether it's a gift. Look, it's looking at the resources, looking at what's in our locker and offering it back to God. How can I bring value to someone else's life today with what I have? Yes. Lord, help me use what I've got. Help me use this, this life that I have to bring value to someone else. The Bible's quite clear on how we can do this. Again, in 2 Corinthians, it says, if God is able to bless you abundantly, that's good. So having abundance is not a problem. Being blessed, having the stuff, having all you know, the, the extra crops, it's a great thing. God will do that. He will bless us abundantly, but there's a reason he will do that, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. God wants to bless us so that we can bless others. We used to sing a song, I am blessed to be a blessing. I am blessed to be a blessing. That's the kingdom dynamic. That's freedom. Not letting things own us. But using things in the way that God wants us to use them to bring value to other people. So we look at what we have and say, God... This, this, this is all yours. This is all yours. You've made my fields prosper. Show me how to express with what I have that you are my treasure and the riches are not. I feel like that's a great start of moving on a pathway towards freedom. I want us to do something uh, this morning to finish. Um, I remember earlier in the message I asked you to have a thought in your mind about the area of your life that you would like more freedom in, that you would like to experience more freedom in, that you want something that you have to do or something that you need to stop doing. I want us to take it to the next step. That's a good first step, but I want us to take it to the next step to acknowledge that something needs to change. You see, we're transformed by having new thinking. And if we want transformation, it begins with different thinking. But now we need to take a second step. We need to take those thoughts and we need to put it into action. And I think that the next step is to bring this area before God. Is to come to God and say, God, I know I haven't been all that I should be in this area. Or I'm committed to doing better. I'm committed to doing better. And you know what? Prayer, bringing it to God in prayer, prayer changes things. Prayer changes the atmosphere. Prayer changes the circumstance. Prayer changes our heart. Prayer changes our thinking. When Paul is describing the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6, you know, and he uses all these metaphors, he uses the shield of faith, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the sword of the spirit, the helmet of salvation. He uses all these metaphors. And then at the end of that, he says, and pray. On all occasions, with all kinds of prayers. He doesn't use any metaphor. He doesn't call it, get your bazooka of prayer out or get your surface to air missile of prayer out. He just says, and pray. And don't stop praying. Prayer is part of our battling. And believe me, when we talk about freedom, freedom is not something that just comes to you. Freedom is something that we have to fight for. Freedom is something that we have to fight for. We have to do battle with in order to, 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 to get it. So what I want us to do this morning is take a step. I've got these little pieces of blank paper and I've got a freedom box. Okay, on this box it says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And what I would love is for us, each of us today to come to the front, write on a piece of paper the area that we want freedom in, more freedom in, and we're going to put it in the box. Nobody's going to look at this. It's all going to be anonymous. I'm not going to look at it. We may 
I don't know, we may do something later with it later on together, but I'm not going to look at it. This is just a representation of a commitment of a prayer to God. And I think it's good to take that step this morning. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put on a song. I'm going to leave that just there. With, there's some pens there. The song that I'm going to play is a song that I want to do in a couple of weeks' time. It's a new one. It's a song that says, it's because of Jesus, I have been changed. Because of Jesus, I have been changed. And so as we are coming up, as we're listening to the song, I want you to let these words kind of soak in your spirit and remember that it's all because of him. We are changed because of what he's already done. But now we have to take the steps. We have to take the step towards freedom that he's called us to live.